Good afternoon, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm Debbie Gatte, the Philanthropy Roundtable's Vice President of Strategy and Operation and Innovation. Our discussion topic today is something that all parts of the country are currently talking about and concerned about, just how fair and free are our elections. We're gonna discuss an aspect that isn't necessarily getting a lot of airtime, philanthropy and elections. The fact is that philanthropy is playing an increasingly influential role in our election processes, not just in terms of political ideas, but of the very means in which we exercise our right to vote. Now the Philanthropy Roundtable represents the largest network of funders committed to philanthropic freedom, philanthropic excellence, and advancing liberty, opportunity, and personal responsibility. As you can imagine, the role of government comes up a lot in these issues, as does the role of philanthropy. When it comes to elections, the process by which our representatives in government are selected, does and should philanthropy play a role? That's one of our questions for today. And here to help us explore these important and timely issues are Bradley Smith, Lawson Bader, and Christian Adams. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a group that has been thinking about and working on these issues for years. So we're really lucky to have them with us today. I'm gonna to take a minute to introduce um, our three panelists. And then we're gonna move into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of them to go through some important questions. Everyone will come back for a Q&A towards the end. Okay, so that's our plan. Um, I'll start with Bradley Smith. Bradley Smith is one of the nation's foremost experts on campaign finance law. He served on the Federal Election Commission until 2005, including as chairman of the commission during that time. He's also the founder and chairman of the Institute for Free Speech, formerly known as the Center for Competitive Politics. And he is also a professor of law at Capital University Law School. Thanks for joining us today, Brad. Lawson Bader, hi Lawson. Lawson is president and CEO of Donors Trust, a public charity safeguarding the intent of donors who prefer private rather than governmental solutions to societal concerns. He is a member of the Forbes Nonprofit Council has a ringing telephone, <laughs> um, a Kiplinger contributor, and serves on the boards of the Atlas Network and State Policy Network. We're glad you're here, Lawson. And finally, Christian Adams. Christian served on um, the voting section of the United States Department of Justice. He was appointed in August by President Trump to be a commissioner on the United States Commission for Civil Rights and is president and general counsel of the Public Interest Legal Foundation a public interest law firm devoted to election integrity. Thanks for joining us today, Christian. Thank you. All right. So uh, these are our guests for today. And I'm going to ask Brad to stay and for Christian and Lawson to turn off their mics and their cameras so that Brad and I can have a conversation. Um, so Brad, <laughs> I want to spend a few minutes talking with you about how and why philanthropy became such a powerful player in elections. Uh, you've worked on issues of political free speech and elections for a long time. Can you tell us a bit about your role on the Federal Elections Commission and what that commission does today? Sure. The Federal Election Commission, despite its rather grandiose name of an election commission, is, is really uh, handles only a small part of American elections, and that's federal campaign finance laws. Administration of elections, voting processes, and so on, really are all part of the, the state system. So when, uh, for example, uh, nonprofits would be most likely to run into the FEC directly would be uh, if, for example, C4 organizations, which are allowed to do a limited amount of overt political activity, you know, vote for this candidate, vote against, but they have to file reports with the FEC. Uh, sometimes if organizations uh, coordinate it or, or are alleged to have coordinated activities. So for example, C3s and C4s can both do lots of different activity about public affairs of different sorts, and it's perfectly fine from an FEC standpoint, but if they are deemed to quote, have coordinated it with a candidate, then it counts as a contribution and that would bring them into conflict with the, with the FEC. So that's where the FEC typically sees people. Again, its main job is enforcing the nation's laws on, on campaign finance contributions and, and reporting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so philanthropy, when did the philanthropic dollars begin to influence the electoral process and why did that start happening? Yeah. Well, in a sense, uh, I mean, I mean, the, 
you know, remember, we didn't really have mass elections uh, until about the middle of the, the 19th century. So by the late 19th century, philanthropic organizations were already playing an important role, if not directly in campaigning for candidates, in raising public issues. And this goes back to groups like, you know, at the time, suffragette movement, the anti-saloon league uh, organizations like that. When it comes into the what we think of as sort of the modern issues come up really with the imposition of the income tax and corporate taxes. Before that, there was not really much of an issue. People had money and they spent it or they didn't and they spent it on politics or they spent it on charity or they spent it on whatever. Uh, but once you had the income tax, then there was a question of what corporations would be exempt and would people be able to get deductions from their personal income tax for gifts to these groups? So that's when we see the government start to get heavily involved. Um, in, uh, and, and what we've seen over the course of the 20th century is a kind of a steady pushback. Typically, the IRS had been fairly aggressive in trying to limit uh, philanthropic involvement, whereas Congress and the courts were more lenient in allowing it. So under the early income tax laws, business leagues, chambers of commerce, boards of trade, civic leagues or organizations, and organizations for the promotion of social welfare were all viewed as exempt. Uh, and this included groups, again, advocating for women's suffrage, for ballot reform, groups teaching socialist philosophy, uh, a group for the perpetuation of the U.S. flag. Most of these things didn't involve saying vote for this guy, vote against this guy, but we can see quickly how the you know, discussion of these kinds of public issues quickly blends in to the political side of things. And that's what we have, you know, yet to this day. And if you want to encourage people to, to think about certain issues in public policy, that can influence ultimately how, uh, how they vote. And so you had this back and forth uh, pushback. In 1934, Congress passed a law saying you couldn't be exempt or get tax deductions if a substantial part of your activity consisted of, uh, of propaganda. And that followed a, a, a IRS regulation from 1919 in which the IRS had said that any group distributing controversial or partisan propaganda could not be uh, exempt as a, as a nonprofit. Um, well, what was a substantial part? That went back and forth for a long time. And then in 1953, uh, as they were amending the, the Internal Revenue Code or creating our modern Internal Revenue Code, Senator Lyndon Johnson was uh, opposed by a lot of groups that were strongly anti-communist. They had radio stations and stuff like that. And he got very uh, upset by that. And so he proposed an amendment which said, and political activity won't count or, or, or will we'll lead you to lose your exemption too. It's not clear if, he met, if it wasn't clear before that if that counted as propaganda, political activity. So that's what created our modern system in which essentially C3s cannot participate in partisan elections, but they can do things like vote, nonpartisan voter registration drives and so on. And it's very easy to do a nonpartisan voter registration drive and know that you're more likely to register Republicans or Democrats depending on where you go to do it. Um, for one example. And then of course, C4 organizations, which have more leeway and can engage in some partisan activity as long as it doesn't constitute their primary uh, purpose. Right, okay. So um, you gave us some examples of um, early efforts that were not directly election focused. What are some of the early efforts that are election focused that you could share with us? Sure. Well, there were groups that would uh, endorse candidates from time to time. Um, I'm trying to remember what are some of the specifics. Uh, really, I could just remember the groups that were denied exemptions. For example, the Anti-Cigarette League was uh, denied an exemption. Most people would say, oh, no, that's who we want to have the exception. <laughs> They were viewed as uh, contributing to partisan propaganda. You know, some of them would would jump out now and then and do overt political endorsements. Um, uh, one interesting example was, and, and of the certain arbitrariness to it, was in 1928, I believe it was, the NRA was held by the Board of Tax Appeals to be an educational organization that would be exempt. And then in 1944, without any sign that the NRA had much changed what it was doing, it had that exemption pulled away from it, saying, no, you're, you're now engaged in substantial uh, propaganda. Um, Planned Parenthood uh, and, and other uh, family planning organizations uh, uh, were not allowed to be exempt early on. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution had to go to court for a time. Zionist organizations were denied the exemption. And all of these groups, you know, some of them were doing overt vote for these candidates, vote against. Others were just doing, you know, talking about issues and saying, you know, these are important important issues and should lead to legislation. Again, the Anti-Saloon League was one that was a huge player and actually did a lot of partisan work in the 1910s, 1920s. Mm, right. 
So we are in an election year. Um, what are some of the key best practices for funders and nonprofits during an election year, given all of your experience? Well, start on the on the FEC side. You know, they, if they're C4 organizations or they're funding C4s, they should be aware of what C4s can and cannot do. Since the Citizens United decision, C4s can do independent spending, but it still can't amount to more than half of what they do, and they have to pay attention to that. Again, you cannot coordinate your activities with a candidate, and things that might not be viewed as campaign related may become reviewed as uh, viewed as campaign related if they're done in coordination with the candidate. And the FEC has a lengthy complex rule on what constitutes coordination. And all I can really say here would take, I mean, most of the webinar to kind of go through it. So people should probably, you know, need to, to look at that or, or go over it quickly with their attorney if they have any kind of contact with, with candidates or, or office holders. Um, so again, know what C3s can do and what C4s can do. Uh, be aware that you do need to file reports if a C4 is doing uh, any kind of direct ads uh, that, that mention a candidate close to an election or that advocate for or against the election of a candidate. Great. That's great advice. Thank you, Brad. All right, Brad, I'm going to ask you to turn your camera off and we're going to turn on Lawson's camera and have his mic on. And while we're doing that, I just want to let everybody know that at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box. And if you have questions for our panelists, please do drop them in there at any time. And we are going to either work them in as we have our conversation or we will have a Q&A period at the end when we can pull those up. Um, okay. All right. So hi, Lawson. Hi, Debbie. Hi. So now that we've talked a little bit about how and why philanthropy became a player, I would like to talk with you a little bit about where these philanthropic dollars come from and where they go. Um, so Brad has shared a little bit about how and why we got here. Can you tell us more about today's situation? I mean, where are these philanthropic dollars coming from? Sure. So I think it's important to sort of define when we're talking about the general category of election reform in the C3 world, which is where we're primarily focused. We're really talking about a couple of key areas. So issues of redistricting, uh, getting out the vote, uh, election security, and then sort of institutional change that can involve the census uh, and more recently the electoral college. So we're not looking at necessarily civic education or for example, the controversy over the 1619 project and these sorts of things. Um, the reality is we don't, we don't really know where all these dollars are sort of coming from. We have a general sense of how things have evolved over the last five, 10 years. And of course, we are in a major election year where we're not going to know certain things that C3 is spending on until they file their own 990s next year. So uh, yes, it's helpful to have a, a Mark Zuckerberg 300 million publicity round so we can get things like that. But we're not really going to know final numbers till till next year. So it's important to kind of look, however, the 10,000 foot level as to how things have been spent over the years, and especially the 2016 election. When it comes to redistricting, um, conservatives, Republicans tend to actually spend out of the actual Republican Party coffers um, when they're dealing with redistricting plans. So in 2016, they, for example, spent almost $30 million. The Democratic Party spent more like 10. Um, but when it comes to C3 funding, including, say, university centers and research related there, too, um, it sort of swaps. So mo more support tends to come from sort of center left groups than does center right. Um, when it comes to get out the vote, same thing. Um, conservatives tend to spend more on the C4 side of the equation, not the C3. Um, on election security, it seems to be a bit of a shift in recent years. Uh, more conservative funders are putting more dollars into organizations focused on uh, securing the vote, mail-in security, um, you know, voter ID rules, this sort of a thing. Um, I think that's also going to affect litigation efforts that tie in with that after an election has occurred. And then again, on the institutional change, so census, for example, and, and reforming the electoral college, um, we're seeing more conservative dollars flow into those kinds of organizations, um, though I suspect there's still more on sort of the center left. I kind of made a quick list of some of the new players over the last five years, um, assuming they're also playing in the game right now, and you've got uh, the Clymer Foundation, the Littman Foundation, uh, Craig Newmark, who, who was founder of Craigslist, has been much more engaged. Uh, the Reed Hoffman Foundation, Mark Zuckerberg, has obviously just made a, a significant splash. Um, the uh, neo-philanthropy is uh, sort of focused on the census and voter registration. It's an organization where you have a lot of donors coming together to support things. 
but you're also seeing the familiar names that we, we've sort of watched, the Carnegie Foundation, the Democracy Fund, the Ford Foundation. Uh, the Koch Network is still involved, although they have been pulling out of some of the 2020 election issues relative to 2016. But the Libre Initiative, uh, which is something they were involved with, is, is still there at Knight, MacArthur, Open Society. And then, of course, the, 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 the donor advised funds like Donors Trust and Tides Foundation and Arabella are all part of that mix, too. And I think it's important to, to mention that you know, conservative C3 groups in this space, frankly, tend to get more of their support from individuals. Um, whereas sort of quote unquote more liberal C3 groups in this world tend to get more institutional foundation support. Um, again, it makes it easier to sort of quote unquote track the funding from foundations than necessarily from individuals. Um, and that's just sort of is where we are right now. Hmm. Sounds like everyone's involved, but in different ways, C3 versus C4, individual mm -hmm. versus, versus institutional. Right. Um, so, I want to ask you a little bit about a phrase that um, gets tossed around a lot, this, this dark money, the phrase dark money. Um, what do you think people mean by that? And um, do you think that's attributable to one side or the other? Has your own organization been affected by these sort of dark money allegations? Sure. You know, you can look uh, really to the, the days and months after the Citizen United decision in 2010 as to when you really began to see the use of dark money as a sort of common lexicon in use. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to remember the context uh, of what was happening when Citizen United decision was made. And with all due respect to Brad and the FEC commissioners, for many years in D.C. you had this game being played between the Democrats and Republicans that whoever was in charge try to pass campaign finance laws that would hurt the other side. So Democrats go after corporations, Republicans go after unions and this sort of a thing. And then all of a sudden, Citizens United comes along and boom, you've got a complete different perspective. You've also got to remember that going on about that time was the passage of Obamacare, the Dodd-Frank uh, financial reform bill and the, some, and the stimulus package, which was very popular with many and very unpopular with others. And so out of this, all of a sudden comes Citizens United and it almost sort of unleashed the, the pent up for, uh, angst and, and concern of a lot of people. And so you began to see this dark money being used primarily by sort of union and environmentalist groups um, aimed at anybody who was sort of, they were frustrated with. And that's where the, Lern the Lewis Lerner problem came out at that time. Um, you had some of the outing and attacks on donor privacy, such as, you know, uh, Brandon Ike had to resign because he turned out he had given money to the Prop 8, I think it was a, a repeal of gay marriage in California. Anyway, so you began to see this sort of fomenting, um, and that's when the term really got used. Uh, to <laughs> answer your question, yes, we, we certainly fell uh, into that. Uh, I will say that we were labeled in 2013, you know, the dark money ATM of the right by Mother Jones, which I give them full credit because it, uh, it stuck at least for a while. Um, I also appreciate the marketing uh, efforts because we've actually doubled in size since then. So it, it's been fine. The, the problem is truthfully, uh, it's a term that's now used by both sides. Um, and uh, especially going after donor advised fund providers, um, which have become quite popular in part because an account holder wants privacy, he or she can get it. And it's really unfortunate. I mean, I mean that very sincerely because what's happened is this frustration with the perceived money in politics and PACs and C4 and C6s and all of this, especially prior to Citizens United, has now just spilled over uh, and is now focused on the C3 world which is doing a lot of damage. Um, you know, C3 public charities, we could argue, are very much part of the founding of this republic. Um, the idea that an individual can use his or her resources to address a problem that he or she thinks needs to be addressed. And so now to sort of attach dark money to this um, is something that's done very often by Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, and when we have this sort of nefarious idea developing at a time when everybody seems to think there's a uh, conspiracy theory around the corner, it's made it very, very difficult to operate. Um, and we've begun to attack this idea of privacy when we really have a negative connotation of secrecy. And that's, I think, what's made life very difficult. So it's used by almost anybody now to attack everybody. And that's, that's unfortunate. Sounds like it. Definitely unfortunate. Um, so let's see if we can give our audience a, a sense of the, the scale here. 
Um, just how much money are we talking about? Um, and you mentioned that this is very hard to pin down, obviously. So how much money are we talking about, but what do we know and what don't we know when it comes sure. to philanthropy and elections? Well, here are some things that we know. Um, so first of all, you know, how many groups are really in this space, in the C3 world? And I did a little experiment this last week. I emailed some conservative leaning friends of mine who are involved in the political sphere. I said, do me a favor and try to list all the center right groups that are involved in sort of election related issues. And the same thing with three of the friends of mine on the left to say, you list your groups. And then I kind of compared them. And, you know, it came out to be about 15 to 20 conservative groups and about 65 democratic groups. That either means the conservatives have no idea what their own people are doing, uh, or in fact, there really is more C4 activity and less C3 to go to my earlier point. Stanford uh, did an analysis on the 2016 elections in which they, they discovered or, or, or guessed that private foundations were, had spent about $450 million on these redistricting voter registration, uh, voter security kinds of C3 groups. Um, that was four years ago. Uh, there's no question we are going to meet that at a minimum. Throw in Mike Zucker, Mark, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg's 300 million, we practically already doubled it. Um, and these are based on things that have already been announced. So you have a Zuckerberg grant, you have $100 million being sort of raised or spent by vote.org or US Vote Foundation or TurboVote. Um, you've got the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has said we'll put $30 million into uh, sort of campaign issues. You've got on the conservative side, the Save Our States and Honest Election Project, uh, that's 25 to 30 million right there. So the point is you're, you're already ratchetly sort of moving up. And this is again where things have been said they will be spent, but we don't actually know. But what you have to add into what's unique about 2020, and this was all made public in 2019, where the number of foundations that are going to pour money into election areas when it comes to sort of journalism integrity. So the Knight Foundation, for example, wants to commit $100 million to help local news outlets sort of beef up coverage of the elections. Um, the Hewlett Foundation has something called the Madison Initiative, which is you know, looking at how propaganda is spread and understanding that. Uh, Craig Newmark, I mentioned earlier, Craig's list has already given $100 million to sort of fund journalism centers looking at election security and whatnot. So if you look at all of that combined, we're easily at a billion dollars um, in, in the larger C3 world. But um, we can do this again next year and we'll sort of see what that was, uh, if that's correct or not. All right. Thank you very much, Lawson. That was uh, extremely helpful and I think sets up the conversation nicely for Christian. Um, the number of C3 things seems to be really expanding. Uh, so thanks, Lawson. I'm going to ask you to turn your camera off and have Christian come on and join us. And Christian, um, so Lawson set this up really nicely and what I'm hoping we can talk about a little bit is what specific ways these dollars are being spent and what some of those consequences might be. Um, so until this year, maybe you could tell us a little bit what kinds of activities were being funded by private philanthropy? Right. My organization is part of that C3 world, the Public Interest Legal Foundation. We're in the litigation space where a public interest law firm dedicated totally to election integrity. We have cases going on all over the country, all through C3 dollars. Um, when I was at the Justice Department, this is 15 years ago, we began to see, or at least I did, and some other folks who, who I worked with there, how important process was. And that's a word you're gonna hear from me over and over again. Not policy, but rather process to sort of one ideological spectrum where they were uh, very obsessed with how changes uh, were occurring to how elections are being run. Process is how elections are run, who runs them, how they're run. And um, the C3 space was already very crowded 15 years ago on one side, because we would see the pressure coming in to the Justice Department uh, on a variety of issues. Um, you know, sort of the heritage issue here, Debbie, is voter ID. But in 2020, it's morphed into dozens and dozens of things I, I have on my list that can explain where the, where the battle space is today. Okay. All right, so um, we're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> we're in an election year. So tell us about some of those new things. What are some of the new activities, tactics, and strategies that you're seeing being funded in the C3 space? 
Well, look, it all goes back really to, to HR1. HR1 was a bill introduced in Congress uh, last uh, year in this Congress, which was the laundry list of everything that was wanted for process changes, transformational changes. Well, it didn't really get very far. I mean, it passed the House, but that doesn't mean too much these days. And then COVID came, and that just completely upended the entire, uh, the entire space. All of a sudden, all of these process rules that were in HR1 were suddenly urgent to be passed. Now, everybody knows about vote by mail. That's sort of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the soup, soup de jour of process litigation this year, but it's not just vote by mail. We've had fights over what does motor voter mean? How do you do list maintenance? When can you clean voter rolls? Same day registration issues, which by the way, same day registration is a process rule that actually yielded big policy outcomes in the Minnesota Senate race between Al Frank and uh, when he won that seat, because a lot of people who weren't eligible to vote in Minnesota did vote because they have same day registration where you just walk up and vote for those of you who don't follow process rules. And that actually swung that Senate seat to a filibuster uh, uh, proof majority to pass Obamacare. So process has a policy ramification. But you also have early voting. You have how you deal with states cross checking the rolls to see about duplicate voting, felon disenfranchisement, and probably what I think is the most under rated one and that's citizenship verification. You know, we know that there's a lot of non-citizens getting on the rolls around the country. We have litigation against Pennsylvania right now about that, also North Carolina. And the problem is that whenever, you, you know, and most people say, well, you don't want citizens on the rolls. But I can tell you, Debbie, when I go to a courtroom, there's like 15 lawyers on the other side trying to defend the vulnerabilities. Uh, and that happened in front of Judge Leon in the district court in DC. Um, it is a it is a battle on all of these process issues that I just talked about. So where are the C3 dollars coming in on these issues? They're coming in everywhere. There's even C3 dollars on, and I think Lawson mentioned this uh, in one context, the media side of this. Open Society, for example, has a whole revenue stream devoted to uh, paying bloggers to hound me and about five other people all the time. Uh, including some at the Heritage Foundation who, who write about these issues. Uh, it's called the Media Consortium. That's what OSI calls it. And their job is to basically, quote unquote, debunk everything that some people are doing. And so it, it's, it's, on, it, it's not only on the media side, it's not on the litigation side, it's not only the public advocacy side trying to move HR1 through Congress, it's on the technology side uh, where they're building applications uh, to, to sort of accelerate these ideas, you know, whether it's grassroots activism or frankly voting mechanics. Look, it's so extensive that philanthropy in the last three weeks, a group, and I want to get the name right, it's called the Center for Technology and Civic Life, mm -hmm. which is a C3 out of Chicago that before this year had an annual budget of about $900,000, just dumped, oh, we're up to about $20 million directly to state and local election offices, meaning that people don't understand this when they first hear it. The C3 is making direct payments to a government office in strategic locations this year to run the election, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, Madison, to basically double the budget of the Philadelphia election office to create what I call structural bias in the system where Philadelphia is running an election differently than Westmoreland County is in Pennsylvania. Hmm. So the C3 dollars seem to be limitless when it comes to uh, one particular point of view. And is this, um, is this a new 2020 effort where private philanthropic dollars from C3s are going directly to government agencies to run elections? Well, it all started back in, I'm sorry, it started back in the COVID uh, breakout in March, mm -hmm. where groups like, um, um, uh, oh, for heaven's sakes, um, 
Uh, what happens the day after a long in. weekend? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we detected early on that they were plotting the strategy. There was a call that took place with Vanita Gupta and the Secretary of State of Michigan named Jocelyn Benson and some other uh, organizations that said, we're gonna start looking into how we can privately fund certain election offices. Now at the time, uh, when I first heard they were cooking this up, I thought, oh boy, uh, no one will ever fund this. It's, it's permissible, of course, but nobody's ever gonna fund this and lo and behold, they are funding it. And so it seemed outlandish when I first heard about it in March you know, but COVID will bring out anything, I guess, mm. as far as um, how to transform the elections. Yeah. So what do you think are some of the implications of this for our, our current election and our future elections? Well, <clears throat> first of all, for the current election, it's clearly an all-in strategy uh, in, in the philanthropic world. And, um, you know, there's some atmospherics that are very good. The president is aware of these process issues like no Republican ever has been. And so there is the ability uh, to some degree to um, create a more level playing field because of that. Um, the current election is going to see an all in effort, uh, I think, uh, on these process issues. Um, and if they fail, meaning if all, all the folks who wanna affect the media, affect the Philadelphia election office, affect you know, vote by mail, all of these forces wanna uh, get involved and they're pouring everything they've got into it, if they fail, I think there's gonna be one of two things, either a serious reassessment of their philanthropic uh, heft as to not working, or there's gonna be an extraordinary level of bitterness uh, that I don't think we will have ever experienced in this country for a hundred years or more. Hmm. All right, so this is a really a new set of issues, even though this is a longstanding practice, right? Of philanthropy being involved in elections. All right, thank you so much, Christian, for walking us through sure. that. And um, I think my eyebrows raised a little when you talked about the money going directly to election offices. Um, so I'm gonna ask Lawson and Brad to join Christian on screen so that we can answer some questions. Um, this is actually a question, the first one here, um, is a question that we got by email. And I'm curious as to your answers around this. So we've talked about philanthropic dollars that are domestic essentially. But there's also a lot of talk about foreign influence and uh, we got asked whether there's a concern about foreign philanthropic dollars affecting our elections in any way. Any thoughts? Christian, sounds like you might know something about this. Well, um, you know, part of our system that we have of freedom and protecting donor privacy, which I think is a very good thing, uh, and we, you know, our, my organization, the Public Interest Legal Foundation, we filed briefs, um, you know, in conjunction with, with Brad's organization as much as we can, I think on, for example, California Schedule Bs. Um, so I'm a big fan of donor privacy. On the other hand, you start to wonder with the hundreds of millions of dollars pouring into this effort in the way that it's pouring in. I mean, perhaps these are all private, non-sovereign, uh, non-sovereign entities ultimately behind it. Um, but I think all of us who care about donor privacy would draw the line at sovereign involvement. And um, I'm not sure there's the traps out there in federal law to detect or require disclosure of foreign uh, involvement in these philanthropic streams. Perhaps mm -hmm. I'm wrong about that, but I don't mm -hmm. think I am. And Debbie, I was just going to add, I think when yeah. oftentimes when people are talking about that, I think there's a, there's a distinction between the perception of foreign governments being involved as opposed to uh, you know, charitable aspects. I mean, there are obviously foundations in, in Europe and the Caribbean that are technically not U.S. and they're sort of supporting things, or Canada, that Canada under certain law provide things, but that's going to be different than an actual government using some mechanism to, to do that. Most charitable organizations in the US or donor advised funds, for example, whether it's you know, the large Fidelity Schwab down to community foundations, for example, if they're, if they're accepting contributions into their accounts, they have to come through a US bank. So there's a, there's a natural reliance on the existing US sort of financial services system to ensure at least certain dollars are coming from places. But as Christian said, there's you know, the privacy piece, especially in the C3 world, comes into play um, as well. Mm. Yes, thanks. The, the government versus the charitable, I think, is an important um, distinction here. Uh, Brad, were you going to add something? 
I really don't have much to add to what Christian and Lawson have said, except for uh, one point we might make is when we think about uh, foreign government involvement is we should recognize that foreign governments have long tried to influence our elections and probably where foreign governments are involved, that's more an issue for the State Department and our counterintelligence agencies than to try to be handling by regulating, you know, private charities. Uh, now, if we're really concerned about foreign, you know, charity, charitable and private institutions, I think that is a, a different issue and I don't have too much to add to what Christian and Lawson have said. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Uh, so I want to go back to one of the tactics that uh, was mentioned, I think, a couple of times. Get out the vote initiatives. This is a C, typically a C3 driven activity. Um, I can hear some people thinking, well, what's wrong with getting out the vote? Um, how does that actually impact our election process? So I'm going to throw that out to all three of you. So we have these C3 groups that are putting a lot of dollars into these kinds of get out the vote activities. How, do that, how does that affect our process? I think it's a question of where the get out the vote is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll start. Why don't we start with grab this time and work our way around? <laughs> right, yes. You know, it's something I mentioned in, the, in the, our opening conversation, Lance Lawson just says, you know, doing a get out the vote drive, you can decide where you're going to do it. And if you do it in certain inner city neighborhoods, you know, you're getting one demographic that votes very heavily for Democrats. And if you do it in, in other areas, maybe certain rural areas, you're, you're getting or maybe certain exurban shopping malls, you're more likely to get a Republican uh, audience there. Um, and so how you go about registering voters can make a big difference. There's also the fact that uh, the people who are actually doing the registrations you know, have a fair bit of influence. They're not supposed to turn anybody away, right? Because then it would be partisan, but it still is pretty easy to kind of get a quick sense as to whether somebody's in the party that you like or not in the party that you like and either encourage them to vote or say, well, you know, maybe you don't really care. Maybe you should go on, you know, get in, get there and get your shopping done or whatever it is. So yeah, how you do the get out the vote drives can have a very significant partisan effect while technically remaining nonpartisan. Ah, thanks, Brad. Lawson, were you going to add to that? No, I just, that's exactly the point. I think it's, uh, you know, if, you, if you're an organization that is believes very strongly in all citizens voting, unless it's California and New York or certain states, and instead <clears> of <throat> only mean but Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, it can be argued your, your strategy is going to be a little different than, uh, so I think, and again, there's, that, there's nothing illegal about that. I think that's really important to do. It just goes to the nuance of why it makes it hard to have this conversation. And again, C3, C4, different activities, different kinds of uh, uh, transparency. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christian? Debbie, I hope this works. Uh, does everybody see this screen, the Rashawn yes. Slate? Yes. Okay, yep. this shows you how get out the vote and process issues interface. This, I'm gonna scroll through this. Mm -hmm. We, the Public Interest Legal Foundation got this out of litigation we had against Allegheny County in Pennsylvania. And we found this individual, Rashawn Slade, uh, managed to, hopefully I can reduce this a little bit. Okay, he registered to vote on October 1st, 2016. He registered to vote on um, June 15th, 2018. He registered to vote October 6th, 2016. He registered to vote October 5th, 2016. Same person, September 20th, 2016. These are all active registrations in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, Rashawn Slade. Here's another one, uh, September 21st, 2016. These are all active voter registrations, individual voter files. Now we got this because of philanthropic dollars supporting our litigation to get this sort of information. Nobody was doing this before. And what we showed is this individual's registered to vote seven different times in Pennsylvania and was never detected, never detected for four years, okay? Now, if Pennsylvania were to go to a vote by mail state, and I'll try to unshare my screen, uh, and ho stop share, sorry. There you go, well um, done. He was registered to vote seven times actively, and, it, and this is all over the country. This is not just one guy in Pittsburgh. We're finding the same data all over the country. It shows you how vote by mail uh, would interface with those types of errors that you guys just saw to create a certain outcome. And that's one of the reasons RC3 exists is to get that sort of data that had never been out there before because nobody bothered to ask for it. And, and you can see how the process issues work. That was all done by a third party registration drive, C3, 
voter registration drive. That's what it has to do with why I, sh I showed it, because that was a third party drive who did all those registrations. So tying it back to Brad's point about, you know, you want to get shopping and you're stopped, at the, you're stopped on your way in, you just fill out the form and go on your way. And this right. is the result. This is the effect on process. Um, I just to add, I think that's also why, at least conceptually, mm -hmm. you're starting to see more philanthropic dollars go into, again, this sort of larger question of security. Mm -hmm. One could argue that, you know, you, a computer should pick up the fact that so-and-so has actually registered seven times. Easier said than done, of course. But as we shift to essentially almost everything being electronic and everything being remote, it's why you're seeing those dollars go into that larger you know, security technology world, um, which again has its own risks, but that's partly the reason for that. Okay, all right. Um, this is a different topic, switching to something else here from, from our, our Q&A. Um, so on the census effort, so that was another effort that was mentioned. I, well, I'll add this in. I noticed uh, some ads on TV have started for census.gov and they're highlighting different groups of people and encouraging them to fill out the census. Uh, that seems to be a government driven effort. What are the C3s doing on the census side and why do you all think this affects election process? I think I'll start with Christian because I think he knows more about this census portion. You've muted yourself, so I'll get you to unmute yourself. We yeah. were involved um... It was strange. The um, state of Kansas uh, sued the Election Assistance Commission, which is an obscure federal agency, to get their form approved to allow citizenship verification. And the, um, the, uh, the, the, the Justice Department, like they did to some degree in the census case, just threw up the white flag. And so in the census case, they wanted to ask for citizenship uh, data in the census, next census, and the Justice Department was sort of phoning in uh, the, the defense, and it led to a lot of internal um, disappointment with the Commerce Department. Well, what you saw there is all of these lawsuits that, that tried to stop the collection of these citizenship data because they ran the risk of, and this is process once again, if we had citizenship data, we could redistrict better, right? When I was in the Justice Department, we only did Section 2 cases, which are redistricting cases, if we had citizenship data. And we used estimates of the Justice Department, but we always built our districts around citizens. And so this was an effort to get it. Well, you saw 12, 13 lawsuits filed all over the country, it seemed, to stop the collection. And the reason, the bottom line was, because it would have conceivably resulted in the loss of 10 to 15 House districts for Democrats if they use citizenship data. Well, that was a good example how process mattered, and it was an all in effort to stop it. Yeah, Debbie, I think it also, you know, you have to recall it, it's, it's reflecting just the larger, more contentious issue of immigration and everything related there too, and race, et cetera, that has been playing out of the big picture. And that's, it's not the only reason, but that is in part why the census is I think becoming a bigger deal is there's just there's so many sub issues related to that um, that have touched you know on the psyche of right and left and that's what's driving a lot of this too. Okay, Brad? Yeah, I, I'll just use this opportunity I guess to add rather than direct that question that I think what you keep seeing coming up here has been the problem that the IRS has always had in enforcing it, that the FEC has had in enforcing campaign finance laws that the discussion of issues blends in to elections. There's no, you know, getting around it. So if you have a group that's doing traditional, you know, C3 work, um, it's going to be encouraging people to do one thing or another, to have certain ideas about policies, even just about the way they privately live their lives, and that will shape their, their political outcomes. And so we see that with their political attitudes. And we see that, you know, over and, and over and over. Um, you just can't get a, away from the two things. Even, you know, the three of us or the four of us sitting here talking today about the role of philanthropy in elections, some people would say, well, that starts to sound like they're, you know, saying things that are going to favor a Republican or a Democratic point of view, right? And this is all being done by the philanthropy roundtable. I mean, politics and public affairs just cannot be clearly and, and easily 
separated. And they probably shouldn't be uh, for the most part, but it does require, or it does make it worthwhile for us to consider how, you know, uh, philanthropies are involved in, in, in that indirect way, usually in the election process. And Debbie, let's also not forget that, that literally, particularly because of the last six months, everything really is local right now, because that's all we have. Um, people are quite local in the, in the literal sense of the word. And so uh, while, uh, and so I think for donors, um, you're looking to your own backyard in your own state, in your own county, because Washington in some cases is now quite literally a long way away because you haven't been there for six months because you haven't traveled. So I think that's also heightening sort of the focus at narrow level. And as Brad said, you know, if you care about literacy, that can become a political thing when it comes to funding of organizations that are, so how do you separate those two things, which again, I think the concern I have over all of the sort of foaming at the mouth on both right and left over, over C4s and sort of that real active has just blended and made us much more complex to be able to have a conversation, especially if the donor wishes to support an organization that aligns with his values, they should be free to do that. They shouldn't be attacked for it just because you disagree with the outcome, but that's the game, unfortunately, it's being played right now. Mm -hmm. Well, we actually got an interesting comment. This isn't a question, it's a comment, but I wanted to give you a chance to respond to the comment. Um, so a commenter uh, is saying that they finding, they're finding this conversation to be pretty partisan. Um, and what I've heard you both say is that there are things happening on both sides. It's in different forms and it's different strategies, but do you have any comment when someone's listening to your description of philanthropy in the elections and they're having a reaction that this is a partisan issue? I'll go well, to Brad's comment he just made. <laughs> right, a conversation and, about this is just hard to make it appear political or not appear. Yeah, Brad's exactly right. I will tell you, Debbie, that if you were to take uh, if, if the head of the Southern Poverty Law Center or the Lawyers Committee were to have listened to what the three of us said, they'd probably say, yeah, they're describing reality. Uh, they're just describing a reality where those organizations are blessed with more dollars. And they would admit to that. This is not speculation or subject to uh, different interpretations. What the three of us are describing is just what is happening. It's very clinical. Like, you know, we can put on a different partisan hat and this would be a, a different conversation, but what we've been describing is just factually accurate. Brad? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> okay. All right. So Lawson gave us an estimate um, earlier of a billion, approximately, um, dollars. I wanted to give Christian and Brad a chance to comment on that and to add anything that they wanted to. Well, don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> It was an estimate. You walked us through your process. <laughs> yeah, I mean. it's, it's a lot of money. Um, you know, one thing that's always worth keeping in mind is, is putting things into, into perspective. Uh, I mean, we'll spend in more direct partisan spending uh, in this election, probably about seven or eight billion, and it may go higher because uh, the Trump campaign is spending a lot of money and, and some others are as well. So it's a lot of money and it can influence uh, elections, but most spending is still done directly by candidates and parties in, in this country. And the philanthropic voices are very important, whether they're talking about environmental issues or, you know, uh, just, just almost anything. I mean, they bring important voices to the table and people should hear those perspectives. And so I don't think we should take the idea that this is all bad. You know, again, we're dealing mainly talking today to C3s, but I was like C4s, which can uh, can do more overtly. They can at least do some overt, you know, vote for George, you know, or whatever. And I remember uh, a couple of years ago, and you hear this now and then, uh, but a congressman was saying, uh, he says, these are supposed to be social welfare groups. And instead they're doing uh, these these things, spending money on elections. And I like, this guy's entire career has been spent running for public office. And he's like saying that is not social welfare. And I think when we think about, uh, you know, living in a democracy, doing things that affect uh, people's attitudes toward public affairs is a form of social welfare. It would seem odd to say that it's not. Christian or Lawson? Okay. Uh, Christian, you mentioned that litigation is something that your organization does to protect the process. Um, so when you talk about election integrity, could you tell us a little bit about litigation and how that protects the process when you're unmuted? 
please. Thank you. This also goes to the question of was this partisan or not? And part of a C3's purpose can be to reduce the burden of government. That is a legitimate purpose of a C3. And that takes me back to 1787 when the founders designed our election system. Uh, they reserve very little power for Washington, D.C. They reserve very little role for the federal government in our elections, with a limited exception, but it was a, an exception designed to preserve the federal government uh, from suffocation by the states. And then the 15th Amendment came along and prohibited racial discrimination and some other federal statutes. But by and large, our Constitution is one that devolves power to the states. And so preservation of that system is a public good, in my view, and is a C3 purpose, uh, as well as reducing the burden of government, uh, in, that could include the federal government, on the states. So I, I you know, it might sound um, in 2020 to be something that it seems a odd C3 uh, role, but in reality, this was the very beginning architecture of our system was a delegation of power over elections to the states. Hmm. Um, Brad, I want to turn to another question for you. Uh, back to the FEC. So you described the, the FEC's role. Do you think the role should be different today in any way, the FECs? Well, I have a long history of writing about the FEC's proper role. And, and in my view, I, and I think to some extent, this conversation shows it as well, uh, it, it's, you can't really figure out a way to make campaigns, quote, fair, right? Uh, different groups and different types of uh, organizations have different advantages. And, you know, what's funny is, is the people who are attracted to different types of organizations think of, of engaging in different ways. I've long said, you know, if, if you tell me what political views you sort of want to get, you know, get after them, I can design for you a, a nonpartisan, you know, even handed on the surface system that gets that group, that gets mostly those people. Now, make it some of your friends as well, but, you know, there's casualties in a war. Mainly you're going to get the other side, right? That's, that's how it's going to work. So, so my view has long been that, you know, we'd be better off to, to simply let people contribute and spend as they choose uh, and, 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 and you know, just let voters make decisions. And I think we see that applying to philanthropy as well. Again, if you look back at the years of the IRS wars and the kind of things that came up a few years ago with uh, uh, the, the Tea Party groups and so on, the IRS is put in a very difficult situation when they're asked to decide, you know, who's engaging in unfair propaganda and, and who's not. You know, and Christian just said, just gave the example, he thinks it's a social welfare benefit to argue for limited government, but there are other people who would argue it's a social welfare benefit benefit to argue for greater government. And as I noted, if you go back, I mean, at times the IRS has, and its predecessor, the, the Tax Bureau, have, have held that it's, it is a, a social benefit to argue for socialist policies and educate the public on that. And other times they've held it's not a social benefit to argue for socialist policies, you know, and, and they're, they're putting this on tenable sort of situation. And so I think we really should just kind of decide if you're a nonprofit organization that you're not, you know, out there with profits going to shareholders or to the uh, other folks involved, that we should probably be less concerned about exactly what you're doing. Because again, all these, you know, public affairs and, and politics blend together. So that would be sort of my general approach going forward. But of course, it, it's just worth noting since we're in a webinar and make sure that folks listen, remember that's not quite the law yet. So you do got to watch your lines. That's right. That, that advice is really important at the beginning about watching those lines and, and learning what they are. Um, all right. So I want to bring us to a close. We've got just a few minutes left. And um, Lawson, before we do that, are there some resources that you would point people to if they want to learn more about what's happening from the, the right and the left, if you want to describe it that way in terms yeah, of funding? Sure. Um, so the Center for Media Democracy, which would be a skewing left organization, runs SourceWatch. Um, and then the Media Research Center, which skews right, uh, does Influence Watch. Both of those are theoretically look up an organization, tells you things about them, how much they're spending, this sort of a thing. Um, a Ballotpedia uh, is another really good resource, trying to look broadly at who is doing what within the election world. Um, Alex Daniels, actually, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, uh, wrote a really large 
uh, piece in December of last year, kind of asking the question, you know, can philanthropy save democracy? And he began talking about some of this. In fact, some of the lists that I got came from that. So those are four sort of uh, resources on sort of left and right um, that probably are helpful to get some quick and dirty and people can make their own uh, analysis of what they see as sort of the bias. But some of the numbers are numbers because they're reported as such. So. Exactly. Christian, do you want to add to that list? Capital Research Center. Um, Scott Walter, Lawson mentioned Influence Watch. I think they're... Yeah. Right. And Debbie, for, yes. for people who are really interested in the in the tax history, the history of the tax treatment, uh, at the Institute for Free Speech, uh, Allison Hayward wrote an excellent detailed report on that a few years ago called External Inconsistency, and one can mm -hmm. find it at our website that, that gives that sort of whole history about these battles over who got to be tax exempt and who did not. All right. We'll have to look at all those resources and make sure that uh, we help share them uh, so people can look at this on their own a little bit more. So. Um, Final word to each of you on this topic. What do you hope people take away? I'll start, I'll start in the reverse order. So I'll start with Christian and then go to Lassa and then go to Brad. It's, it, there is a, a, a line I've heard once that somebody says, I really don't care much about what the government does. I just want to pay attention to my own life. And they said, you might not care about the government, but they care about you. And it's sort of about philanthropy. Um, the idea that philanthropy might not be involved in elections, uh, that train has left the station. They're involved in, in elections in a way that um, I don't think will ever change. Okay, good for all of us to know who work in philanthropy for sure. Lawson. I'll take your cynicism and concern over secrecy and apply it to really as privacy when it comes to charitable dollars going to legitimate public seat breeze. That's a dangerous, slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. Thank you. And Brad. Uh, as I've said a couple of times about, it's always repetition is at the heart of learning and I'm a professor, right? So uh, um, it is difficult, if not impossible, to cleanly separate elections from discussion of public issues and public affairs. And it's difficult to separate public issues and public affairs, even from the most basic sort of uh, ideological concerns we have, whether they're based on, you know, what, what churches and religious groups are doing or other groups that just have a vision of a good society. And what's philanthropy all about other than promoting a vision of a good society? All right. Well, thank you all, um, the three of you, for being here today and for walking us through um, the facts and what you are discovering as you dig into these issues. Uh, again, these are issues that all of you have been working on for years, they all seem to be accentuated this year with COVID and our current election. Um, but I think you've given us a really good overview on what to look for, what to think about, and where this might be going. So thank you for that. And um, to our audience, thanks for joining us today. We, will, um, we have a, a survey in the chat that we would love to hear your reactions to the discussion and also your suggestions for what we should cover next. So take, please take a minute in the chat to do that. Um, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Lawson. Thanks, Brad, for joining us Thank today. You. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.